Good afternoon, everyone. We're here today to announce the first round of approved projects for the Community Recovery and Revitalization Program. As you might recall, this was an important initiative that we strongly advocated for during the last session and worked with the legislature to secure $40 million in federal ARPA funding to support projects across the state, which will help our communities grow and recover. Of the $40 million, about 10 million will go out in this first round to 31 approved projects. That funding will help leverage and support project costs totaling more than 153 million. Commissioner Goldstein will offer more details on the program in the first round of award winners. And we're grateful to have at least one of them here. We were going to have two, but the weather might have delayed them a bit to talk about how this funding will support their revitalization projects and their communities. These first 31 represent diverse areas like housing, childcare, and agriculture. They're also supporting the arts, entertainment, and hospitality sectors, which suffered significant losses during the pandemic. As I've long said, we must be strategic and make lasting investments with this one-time federal money. My administration has been fo focused on that goal, and this program will help businesses and organizations over the long term. ARPA funding has received a lot of attention over the last year, mostly on how and where to spend it. And we're now beginning to see how transformative it can be with projects like these. But we can't stop here. We have to continue to look down the road and make smart investments that will build on the progress we're making. The funding decisions we make today need to work in tandem with the many state programs we already have. It's why in my budget, we increase funding for our downtown organizations and regional development organizations so those on the ground can help prioritize projects that need financial support to help create a vibrant downtown structure. It's also why we must support economic development initiative, initiatives, like making sure we have industrial space available and ready. So it's, a, so it's there when a company looks to move or expand here or continue to fund brownfield redevelopment projects. As I've said, there's no quick fix for the state. It will take all of these programs working together to make lasting changes in all 14 counties. So we hope the legislature will continue to work with us to prioritize investments that help the parts of the, our state that need it most. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Goldstein to talk more specifically about the program and those 31 projects. Thank you, Governor, and hello, everybody. Our team in the Department of Economic Development has been hard at work reviewing these um, community recovery and revitalization program applications to ensure that the awarded projects uh, are making capital improvements or capital expansions that spur the economic recovery in communities that need the revitalization all across the state. As the governor mentioned, 31 projects have been approved for funding thus far, and we've spent just a little over $10 million of the $40 million available has been allocated. Um, these. Uh, these projects will be, uh, so this 10 million will be supporting $153 million worth of project costs. So just this bit of government money helps spur additional capital investment. Uh, these projects are expected to support 354 existing jobs and enable the creation of 205 new jobs, 79 new affordable housing units, 196 new child care slots for low to moderate income families. The awards are spread across 12 counties with 20 projects coming in from the priority groups. We had historically underrepresented groups and towns with stagnant or declining grant list values uh, were looked at first. This program also was made available to municipalities, and we're happy to say three were awarded in the first round. That's Highgate, Manchester, and Killington. And we're very pleased with the variety of projects that we're seeing, all types of projects that are being supported through this program. The demand we knew was uh, acute 
uh, when we first developed it, and we want to impact areas as diverse as childcare, affordable housing, tourism, the arts, and agriculture to really make this, truly make this a unique program. In total, we've received 83 applications, uh, including the 31 that have been approved, and it, that is to support more than $408 million in project costs. So what's, what's so inspiring about having this uh, pot of funding is to see the great projects that are being done all over the state by all kinds of people and all kinds of organizations. Applications not approved in this round are, remain under review, um, and they'll be announced in the coming weeks as they are approved. Applications will continue to be accepted until the funds are allocated. As the governor mentioned, the ARPA-funded projects are a great start, and it's great to see ARPA dollars at work, but we know we need to do more, and we need to maximize these investments, and that's why we need the legislative support to support our full slate and portfolio of economic development initiatives this year, including Brownfields, the Rural Industrial Development Fund, the um, Vermont Training Program, and New Worker Incentives. So we can continue the work of ensuring our communities are able to recover, grow, and continue to be revitalized in the future. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Moe Moulton and Letty Moulton from Neck of the Woods Daycare, which is based in Waitsfield, one of our recipients. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Moe Moulton. Um, I'm the executive director of the Neck of the Woods program. This is Letty. Um, we'll see if she can make it through this one. Um, Neck of the Woods is a child care center located in Waitsfield, Vermont. Um, with me here today also is one of our amazing toddler teachers, Destiny Miller. And um, we're hoping that Letty can manage to hold out her sque squeals of appreciation for this grant quicker than, than I can. <laughs> Um, we're absolutely honored to be here today, and we would first like to express our utmost gratitude to Governor Scott, um, to the state legislature, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and those administering the Community Recovery and Revitalization Program. That is hard to say when you haven't slept in three weeks. Um, <laughs> similar to the rest of the state, the Mad River Valley um, has a dramatic shortage of childcare available to families with children, infant through preschool age. Many families have to patch together childcare options, often with one parent staying home and out of the workforce. Providing high quality childcare is a critical component to young working families considering moving to Vermont. Neck of the Woods programming began in the early months of 2020 with our team's vision of providing high quality childcare and early education to the Mad River Valley and the surrounding communities. In 2021, we bought our campus from Small Dog Electronics, which includes 11 acres of land, a 10,000 square foot building and a 5,600 square foot warehouse. At the time of purchase, we began a two and a half million dollar capital campaign to renovate the main building and turn it into a much needed childcare facility. Since 2021, we've renovated the main floor of the building to include five classrooms and bathrooms and improve the building envelope and HVAC systems. We currently have 45 children enrolled per day, ages six weeks to five years of age, and we will be expanding to allow available slots to 68 children per day by the end of this year. This grant that we were awarded of $468,000 will give us the opportunity to continue to expand our facility by renovating the second floor to open up more classrooms, adding handicap access with a new elevator and entryway. It will allow us to continue to update the building envelope and systems to meet all state and federal requirements, and in a county where there are over 1,100 slots needed for infant through preschool age children to meet the demand for childcare, we will be able to provide 125 slots for children in these age ranges once the second floor is complete. We would again like to express our appreciation for this grant and the opportunity to help fill the critical need for childcare for young families in our beautiful state of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll now open up for questions. Maybe we can stay on topic first, and then we'll take the off-topic questions afterwards. Governor, is there a specific, and maybe Commissioner Goldstein can weigh in, is there a specific number that you're looking for from the legislature this year for um, this re revitalization program? Um, we, are, we have a whole slate of economic uh, growth initiatives uh, that we'd like them to, to adopt. Um, so uh, I'll let Commissioner Colsey sure. explain a few of them. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, so for the community revitalization, we're not asking for additional funding, but we're asking for $10 million for a brownfield revitalization and $10 million for industrial development funds to help spur development of industrial facilities all around the state so that we're ready when businesses are growing or when we're recruiting businesses from Canada, as an example. The other uh, asks are $5 million for a Vermont training program and $4 million for the relocated worker. Um, you mentioned housing being one of the sectors to which these grants are going. Um, do you have a sense of how many new units will come on board as a result with, of with this uh, with this forty million dollar grant? With the, with the ten million that uh, is being appropriated in this round, I'm wondering if you can talk I about thirty-one net increase yeah. in, in housing units. So, of, of the in the thirty-one projects, we're going to have seventy-nine new affordable units. That's in White River Junction. Uh, so there's that's one project in White River Junction. That that is that's correct. Okay. For the, for the first round, we have many housing applications in the queue. There'll be more. Uh, for Commissioner Goldstein, I guess it's probably different for different projects. But when you're just you're vetting these applications, what are some of the criteria that you guys are, are weighing? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Project readiness weighs very heavily, as does the. Um, sourcing of other funds. Most of these projects have many sources of funds, and if it's early days, we really are kind of deferring those and asking them to come back when they've located some other sources of funds. I'd say those are the two most heavily weighted. We also look at geographic distribution. We look at childcare and affordable housing. You know, So there's a variety of things that go into it, but I'd say the two largest components are readiness and the leveraging of other sources. Is it Moe? Yeah. Um, you talked about um, this grant giving your organization the opportunity to be able to create more slots for yes. kids. Presumably, you're going to need more people employed in order to yes. do that. Um, can you talk about um, how you think you're going to be able to address some of the workforce issues that other organizations like yours are running into? That's a tough one. We um, we definitely all in childcare see a difficulty in hiring staff. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, exactly. yeah. So we do we do find that it's a very difficult balance um, because in childcare you don't necessarily get paid an extremely large amount of money. Um, so I think what we've been doing is we've been working with our board to piece together how that balance is going to look and making sure that we continue to um, build programs so that we can use a multitude of programs that will funnel the money in together so that we can distribute out more money to our staff than we otherwise would be able to with just one or two programs. So we kind of use a multi-tiered approach to those things. Yeah. Any other questions on topic? Anybody on the line? Yeah, Tim, Sarah, Ed, or Guy have on topic questions. You want to go now and we can circle back for off topics. Off topic. Well, okay. All right. Thank you very much. You. She was very good. <laughs> As you know, Governor, before, um, before town meeting day break, the Senate voted out S5. Looks a little different. Has a has that check back. Has a study associated with it. Does does the current proposal that was voted out of the Senate meet your concerns? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Uh, but we still hope um, that they will be able to make the changes uh, in the legislature as it moves through uh, through the other body, and uh, we'll go from there. What specifically? Would you I, I want to a bill change? to specifically say we're going to take this back in, and then we're going to. I've listed it in the uh, in my veto letter from last year um, exactly what it's going to cost, and what it's going to mean, and what we're going to look for. And I think it really has to be specific and go through the normal bill process. And it really doesn't say that. It says a check back of some sort. And, and that could be changed uh, in a, uh, many different ways. And it really is in the wording uh, because 
who knows who's going to be here when that comes back from the PUC. Um, some of us may not be here. I may not be governor. Who, who knows? So uh, that leaves it to interpretation. And when you go to interpretation, you have to go by the, the words, not what the, the intent was. Um, if I'm staying in a hotel right now, government is paying for me to stay in a hotel or motel, um, and I hit that exit date, right, whether it's May 31st or uh, June 31st, um, what, what's next for me? Well, we've been doing, um, I think, something that's, uh, that hasn't been done before, um, and because a lot of this is new uh, to us, and some, especially the, the expansive nature uh, of all the folks who are in the, enrolled in the hotel motel program. Um, but we've gone in with a team uh, to actually uh, talk with, with them um, to find out what their needs are and uh, what they're going to do or what brought them here and what, they're, uh, what we're going to do in the future. So um, with this uh, type of approach, uh, we'll have a better handle on where they go next and have provide some of the services they need, uh, whether it's in recovery, uh, whether it's in transitional housing, uh, whether it's in any type of other type of temporary housing uh, as well, as well as for long-term housing. So finding job opportunities and so forth. So we are working uh, to try and make sure there's as soft a landing for them as possible. So they can get back on their feet uh, and we can get them into permanent housing in the long run. What would the temporary housing options look like for some of But we still have our program, right? I mean, it's still, it's still there, it's still viable. So the program, a general assistance program, isn't going away, it's just changing. Um, but, um, but with some of the investments we've made in some of the, the um, organizations, um, there will be more housing available uh, tem in temporary in nature uh, there as well. I might ask uh, Secretary Samuelson if she could take it from here. Governor, I think I uh, addressed the question quite well. Um, I just want to reinforce that the agency and the administration have taken a very active role investing in housing, having rehoused more than 3,000 um, people over the period of the pandemic. We continue to work on making unprecedented investment, bringing new units online, as well as um, adding shelter bed and shelter units. Um, as we work forward, um, as the governor reiterated, the agency services and partnership um, across all of the departments, as well as with other um, other agencies, and working to assess the needs, um, both the healthcare needs, housing needs, the economic needs, and the workforce needs in the hotels, which is that's more information than we've ever had before, but also a, a stronger um, resource case and approach um, to, to working with individuals who are experiencing homelessness. We have the confidence that these approaches will give us the information we need to continue um, to move forward and to help the clients that we're working with move forward into housing or other situations in the future. Secretary Samuelson, there, I, I understand there are about 1,800 households in motels and hotels right now. When we go into the new iteration of this program on June 1st or July 1st or whatever it is, how many households will there be capacity for in, in that program? We are currently lately um, total maintenance across our shelters, across the work we're doing for the Vermont Housing and Community um, end of our um, program. Uh, what I can say is there are many individuals who were formerly housed, often with family and friends. Units, um, we came at this point in time um, in, in those um, analysis. But we can, uh, we can and have supported ongoing um, families and house, uh, house their loved ones um, in creative ways, which include providing financial support um, to individuals experiencing homelessness. 
the bond to alternative. Um, what I will say is uh, our current in program is not prioritizing the most vulnerable, and the number of units that are available for decline. The imperative um, for all of us to begin to look at our programs going forward um, to make sure that we're housing children and youth, um, that we're housing individuals with disabilities and older adults um, as we go, because right now we're not able to accommodate them in our current programs. I think you probably got part of that, right? Yeah, I, I guess I'm just wondering, is, is there a number that you can give us for the number of households that will, that the new, that the, that the next version of the program will be able to accommodate at any given time? We're calculating it. Let me get back to you on that. Thank you. That's why we want to continue investing in the VHIP program, for instance, uh, providing for accessory dwellings. Uh, we think that that's provided a lot of units um, for a lot less money uh, than the traditional housing program. So we want to continue to invest in that area and hope the legislature goes along with us. Um, you're going to, in the not too distant future, um, have a bill arrive at your desk that seeks to address uh, the issue of suicide in Vermont by instituting a 72-hour waiting period for firearms purchases and a requirement that gun owners keep their firearms securely locked away when they're not using them. Um, what's your inclination right now? What's the bill number again? Is it 9230? So that that's past the House. It's 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 uh, in judiciary right now. In in judiciary, yeah. so it hasn't got through the House yet, right? It's it's great. Okay, and it's then going. so it gets through the House and then it goes to the Senate. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's got a ways to go. First of all. Yeah. A lot of changes there. I think I've made it fairly fairly clear. I don't believe, I personally don't believe, we need to make any dramatic changes in our gun laws at this point. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, that would be problematic. So we'll take a look at it when the final version finally does arrive, but I'd say it still has a long ways to go. Problematic in what way? For me. In what, why is it, why, what do you Well, like I said, we, we took, uh, as you, probably remember about three or four years ago, we took a lot of steps uh, towards implementing gun safety regulations uh, and oversight. And, uh, and I think we can still improve in that, uh, red flag laws and so forth. There are some provisions that we could, we could adopt and go along with, but if it's too expansive, then it's probably a non-starter from my perspective. But what's the problem that's created for gun owners in the state by the provisions that I was just referencing? Which ones? Uh, Wait, 72 hour waiting period in safe Again, I've, I've been resistant uh, to the 72 hour uh, waiting period. I, I think I even vetoed one. It was for handgun legislation in particular. Um, I just don't think that that's uh, workable. I just don't, I don't, I don't think that that helps the situation. And safe storage, and you know, you're a. Uh, well, again, who's going to who's going to have oversight of that? Um, like, who is going to um, is someone going to go into your home and inspect your home and determine whether you've uh, put your firearms away? I mean, how far are we going to go with this? I mean, that those are the types of things that people are going to ask, and they're going to wonder: Does this give? Um, uh, give law enforcement the ability to, to come into your home to inspect your whether you have your firearms stored correctly. Thank you. Governor, as you also probably seen, uh, the budget adjustment is uh, coming your way. I think it was voted out of conference committee or they're working on it. They did, uh, they did vote, it, vote it out. They no. did. I know you had raised concerns about the size and the scope of some yeah. of the spending. I mean, what, what do you make of the my concerns are still there. Um, it's $50 million over what we had asked for in budget adjustment. Um, about half of that was for uh, the housing piece uh, that, uh, that Peter was referencing. Um, and the other, um, there was $25 million more for uh, VHCB as well. 
So it's not where it's directed in terms of housing, VCB, and so forth, but where's the money going to come from? Uh, you know, we presented a budget that uh, we think was balanced and uh, made the appropriate investments, so it's got to come out of something. With and that. with all the other all the other initiatives they're talking about now, we're talking, I mean, there's a lot of money at stake here, hundreds of millions of dollars. Is, is, are those concerns enough to warrant a veto? We'll take a look when it gets here, first of all. I mean, we have a bill review process. Um, when we get the bill, we have five days uh, to act upon it. And uh, we'll take a look to make sure that there are no mistakes within the bill. I think that's something that a lot of folks miss. Uh, that it's not just, uh, we don't just take the word for it because we've seen, I think it was last session, we had a number of bills uh, that had mistakes there. I um, mean, they were rushed through and there's uh, some oversight, but, um, but you miss things uh, when there's so much at the end. So we wanna make sure that uh, it's workable. We'll have all our agencies and departments look at the, the portions of the bill uh, that they uh, are responsible for and then give us any feedback they might have. At that point, I'll determine whether to sign or not sign, um, or whether to veto, as we do with every bill. Before we head out, obviously, severe weather rolling in. Um, Southern Vermont getting hit pretty hard. I just was wondering discussions you guys had um, uh, beforehand and preparing. Yeah, I mean, we are in uh, constant contact with emergency management. Uh, and I had a cabinet meeting this morning. We went around the table and discussed our areas of responsibility and how we were doing. Um, obviously, the, the southern part of the state got hit uh, the hardest, and well, this isn't over. Uh, we, have, um, we have some concerns about what the high winds are going to, to bring uh, and more snow to other regions of the state. A lot of power outages in the southern part. Uh, before this press conference, I, I learned that uh, we are setting up, I believe, uh, an emergency shelter in the Brattleboro area. Uh, Route 9 is closed. Uh, Route 7A uh, is closed, a portion of that. Route 12, I believe, in Bethel is closed. So um, this is, you know, it's, it's a significant event, uh, Northeaster, and uh, it's not over. So we have our share of concerns. Anything, uh, Commissioner Morrison, you'd like to add to that? Uh, well, sorry, I would add that uh, as of a half hour ago, we had over 36,000 outages reported. So it will be a multi-day restoration period. Um, we have, uh, I've authorized the opening of a partial virtual emergency operations center to coordinate our response and to support the utilities in their work in whatever way possible. Um, so yeah, this one, it, the, the snow accumulation has gone much further north than we anticipated, uh, and we ran a, a higher volume, and so I think once those winds pick up, we're gonna be really concerned with more trees and lines coming down. The governor alluded to uh, several roads that are closed. We had multiple reports of trees on lines or, or uh, just trees across roads too, so. This will be a messy one to pick up from. Everybody should be very, very cautious. Stay home if you don't need to be out there. But we have, you know, we're prepared as well as we could. Um, Green Mountain Power did a great job in bringing over uh, some of our partners from the north in Canada. Uh, so we were all set up, ready to go, and anticipating uh, that there was going to be power outages as a result of the storm. Questions online? Yeah, we'll go to uh, Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express.
recently, last they made the purchase of a company up here, and at the same time, they uh, poached a couple of uh, uh, haulers from another company. Uh, that company couldn't replace the drivers, so they had to give up those routes. I'm just wondering if there's any concern on the administration's part that they're going to develop a virtual monopoly in the state and we'll be able to set their own prices. Um, and they did increase their rates uh, last year and they increased them again uh, back in February. I'm just wondering what your take is on how we can manage this so the consumers are protected by uh, a company that really is operating in almost a monopoly fashion. Yeah, um, well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I don't know is there are many companies, many entities who didn't uh, increase their rates over the last year or two. So I'm not surprised by that. Um, as well, I would say we do have another uh, a major uh, competitor, Myers, out of uh, the Chittenden County area. And uh, there's some others uh, throughout the state as well. So I don't think we're at a point where there's concern about a monopoly, but I, but I understand your point, and we'll continue to monitor that in any way that we can. Um, this is, uh, you know, a problematic uh, in terms of having just one facility that takes all of the uh, trash throughout the state, uh, and so. Again, um, I don't have all the answers to that, but um, but I get your point. When we'll continue to monitor. Okay. The effect in January, once a month pick up in January, it cost me eight dollars plus a dollar sixty one uh, ta uh, fuel tax, and then on top in February, twenty dollars and three dollars sixty one cent fuel tax. I guess I'm wondering if. Seeing how they have a lot of territory locked up, um, they're in the same position as if I was going to try to shop around for another electric utility. I got the non electric co op. I, I can't go and uh, sign up for free amount of power. The electric utilities are regulated in terms of their rates by the Public Utility Commission. Do you think it might be appropriate for the solid to have to go to the Public Utility Commission to justify a rate increase? Yeah, well, again, I don't think we're at that point right now, uh, but we'll continue to monitor the situation. Okay, thank you very much. All right. And, uh, everybody drive safe out there. Thank you. Sarah, did you dig her? Hello, thank you for accommodating me remotely. I was spooked to drive. Um, Governor, the Senate is slated to vote soon on S-18, could ban flavored tobacco products. I'm wondering what your thoughts and feelings are on that one. S-18, I'm not familiar with the bill. Flavored tobacco. Oh, flavored tobacco. Um, yeah, you know, um, I think in the past we've we've uh, commented on that. I'm 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 a, a proponent of uh, as much prevention as possible. I think one in six Vermonters currently smoke, and and I believe that uh, many uh, of our youth that's when they get hooked. And so we need to continue to focus as best we can on prevention. I haven't looked at that bill in particular, um, but, but anything we can do to prevent someone uh, from, from getting addicted uh, to, to smoking, uh, I think would be beneficial for themselves, uh, their families, and society in general. So I'll take a look at it, um, but it's again, it's going through the Senate, uh, has to go to the House, uh, has a long ways to go before it comes back uh, to to here to me. Uh, and even earlier in the process, I may be asking this for nothing, considering crossover is so uh, close upon us. But uh, there's a bill in the Senate S108, which proposes to raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour by January first, twenty five. What's your take on that, just in principle? I, I just think it's unnecessary. I think wages have been inflated. I, I said this before. I wasn't in favor of uh, a $15 uh, minimum wage um, before the pandemic, uh, and I still am not. Uh, I believe that uh, supply and demand uh, 
works. And uh, in this case, I, I believe most people are making well over $15 an hour. Not to get smart, but why not raise the minimum wage by legislation in that case if demand has pushed wages up? Uh, I won't get smart and ask you why we need it, but um, I, again, I just think it's unnecessary. I, I just don't understand why we would have to go through this whole contortion um, when it's not needed at all. And, and I wasn't supportive of, of artificially raising the minimum wage when we had provisions within the bill um, that we have passed over the years. I voted for it uh, when I was in the Senate and uh, put a, a multiplier on there uh, due to the cost of living. And from my standpoint, that's still working. Um, so I just think it's unnecessary. Great, thanks, Walter. Okay. That's it for the installments. If anyone else has anything in the room? Just a clarification. Um, am I hearing you say you don't, in principle, you still need to look at the bill to see what's in there, but, but in principle, you don't have concerns with a statewide ban on flavored tobaccos and vapors. Yeah, I mean, I again, I would like to look at the bill, um, but um, but personally, I I don't have a concern with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much.